certainly good. Once again, we can assemble together <coughs> to worship the great God of this universe and to study from His Word. And we're going to pick up our study this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. And as we had been studying in the previous couple of chapters, as Paul was admonishing them and encouraging them to finish the work of taking up this collection for uh, the poor saints in Judea to go ahead and finish this work, he now uh, switches back to addressing uh, some of the false allegations that are laid against him from the false teachers, the, the uh, false apostles, as even he will, that's what he will call them in the next chapter, chapter 11, uh, false apostles. And as we move toward that, we will be studying and considering some examples of those things and how that uh, this was in fulfillment of the prediction that Jesus made in the Olivet Discourse of how that there would be false teachers, false Christs, false apostles that would arise and deceive the many, deceive the majority, hence the great apostasy. So uh, that's, that's the direction we're heading as we begin in our study here in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians. And here <clears throat> Paul begins by saying, now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. Now, up until this point, or at least some of his writings in the previous epistles, this epistle and the previous one, he would include others with him. For instance... In chapter 1, verse 1 of this letter, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So he includes Timothy with him in this work. In this passage here, then, again in verse 19 of chapter 1, he says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timothy, so here he includes Silas as being with him in this work. And again, then in chapter 6 and verse 1 of this letter, he says, we, notice the plural, we then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. So there's a little different tone here as he begins in this portion of this letter where he is speaking of himself. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you. And notice that he says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And now uh, here we see this word meekness. And even we re recall in the Beatitudes, you know, Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Um, and it is a mistake when we look at the word meek and we comprehend that as weak, there's a difference. Weak means without strength or lacking strength. Meekness is somewhat the opposite of that. Meekness is actually better defined as being strength under control. And no better example of that can be had than with Jesus Christ himself. Because he had all power, uh, even on the cross, or prior to the cross, when he made the statement that he could have called uh, 12 legions of angels. I believe that's when Peter cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Malchus, there. Uh, I believe that's when Jesus said that, that he could summon 12 legions of angels, if he so desired. So, we need to understand the term meekness and again that's strength under control and we'll see this why this is pertinent as we continue on in this study this morning but he says i beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of christ so again notice that paul is associating 
him and comparing himself in a manner of speaking with Christ and he is he is uh, invoking the meekness and the gentleness of Jesus Christ and you know he's he's not he's not saying this I, I beseech you you know by my own power or something of that nature although he's going to point out that he does have power but Paul is saying, I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And he says, who in presence, again referring to himself, who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. Now, I believe this in presence and this word in the original is prosopon, uh, which actually refers to right in front of or face. So in presence and I believe this is referring to his personal appearance as well as his disposition. There seems to be a, uh, a two schools of thought on, on that, the way that's wor that word is used there. Some think that Paul is referring to his physical stature. And uh, while I see that that could be possible, I believe that it has more of an application to his disposition, his attitude toward them. Because he says, but being absent, he says, I in, in presence am base. And that word base uh, means lowly, humble, or timid. And it is used as the opposite or juxtaposed to bold. Okay, so, because in verse 10, uh, the charge is of the false... Uh, apostles, the sum that are mentioned in the next verse. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So, again, th this is at least part of the reason why some think that when he says who in presence, that he's referring to his physical stature. So, you know, I'm not going to say no, that can't be. Uh, this is why I believe it actually applies to both but maybe more so to his attitude, which you actually get that idea from what the false charge is laid against him. Uh, you know, and, and we could see this uh, like, and, and I even see this charge made a lot of times in discussions on Facebook um, that somebody is really, really bold and maybe even arrogant behind the keyboard but if they're in the presence of someone, they're not like that. They're more uh, civil, humble, timid. And a lot of times that's just human nature. And that, that's why I believe that's what Paul is, is doing here when he says, who in presence and base among you. He's referring to uh, not only his personal stature or appearance, but his, his disposition toward them uh, when present with them. And again, in verse 7 of this chapter, he will say, do you look on things after the outward appearance? So see, he asks that question. And the implication is that they are not to do that. But anyway, he says, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. And so um, we look at chapter 13, of this epistle where Paul says, I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now I write to them which heretofore has sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Now notice that that's you know, what these some would do would say, well, now he's, he's just boasting, you know, he's bloviating. Uh, and uh, he's, he's, it's just big, big talk, you know, when he's not in our presence. Paul has the power, and we're going to see this, as, as I said, as we continue on through the study. Paul has power, and he is encouraging them to change their attitude toward him, these some, and he is speaking on behalf of the rest <laughs> uh, who don't have that attitude toward him, to, to show them that these some, whoever they are, 
that they need to have a change of heart before he comes, else he will not spare. <clears throat> so we go in verse 2 then. He says, But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with, with that confidence. So he's just told them, you know, I beseech you myself, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. And he's saying, I don't want to have to be bold toward you when I'm there, when I'm present with you. So in other words, don't force my hand. Don't make me do this. <clears throat> but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some. So there's the some, okay? Which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So see, there, there's the charge. Uh Possibly they were insinuating that, you know, while he makes these really powerful letters, when he's present, he's very timid. Uh, he's, he's a little short guy, uh, you know, and he's just, uh, he, his speech is contemptible. And, uh, you know, he, he's, uh, he's just not, not at all the way he comes across in his letters. And he's, he's, do, he's, uh, he's walking craftily after the flesh. Uh, doing things subtly for his own gain. Just things of that nature. But they were laying these charges against him. <clears throat> and so he's saying these some need to change because I don't want to have to be bold when I'm there. And he's, he's saying I will be if I have to be. I don't want to be. But anyway, he says bold against some. So when we look at 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 21, we notice that he says, what will you? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? See, that's what he opened up here with in this text. I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And so even back in the first letter, he said, it's up to you. What, what do you want? Do you want me to come to you with the rod, or in love and meekness? Then in chapter 15 and verse 12, I'll, I'll pick this verse here to show that, that here is a, I don't know if it's the same group of some or if it's another some. But here he says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? And so in that text then, there was this group at Corinth who were denying resurrection to the old covenant saints of Israel, old covenant Israel. They weren't denying their own resurrection. They weren't denying the resurrection of Christ. They were denying resurrection of the old covenant saints of Israel. But they were just some that were doing that. And so I don't know if it's the same group that are laying these false charges against Paul. I don't know. But I just, I thought that was interesting and I added that in. Okay, in Acts 13 verse 11, I want us to notice here, and I would encourage uh, everyone to go there and read the entire text, uh, because this is where, uh, I believe it was uh, Sturgis Paul, I'll just go there, easier than trying to remember it, uh, Elimaeus the sorcerer, uh, Paul was preaching there, and Sergius Paulus, uh, was a prudent man, verse, th verse 7, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimaeus the sorcerer withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes upon him. Now watch what Paul does. Notice the power. Notice the rod. And said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun, for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Now, don't tell me that Paul didn't have power. So there we have an example of Paul using the rod, so to speak, <clears throat> and Paul exercising his power. 
And so he's telling these Corinthians, these some at Corinth, change, they need to change their attitude because I don't want to have to come in your presence and be bold and use this rod, so to speak. So he says here, uh, I beseech you that I may not be bold when I'm present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So again, these, <clears throat> these some were alleging that Paul walked after the flesh. Now, let's notice a few passages here. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 12, chapter 1 of this epistle. Paul says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation, that's manner of life, in the world, and more abundantly to you word. So see, Paul's explaining to them that he's not walking after the flesh. He's not walking deceitfully and craftily and so forth. He says, this is the testimony. This is our rejoicing, the testimony of our conscience. Okay, then in verse 23 of that chapter, he says, moreover... I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. So, again, here is the reason why Paul had not come yet. He was giving them time to uh, change their ways. Uh, the things that he had written to them to correct, like the one that had his father's wife and various things, and, they had, and he even says, in this epistle, that they had cleared themselves of all those things. But here is this some who is charging him falsely with things as walking after the flesh. And so he tells them, just point blank, this is why I've not come yet. It's to spare you. So he doesn't want to have to come and be bold in their presence. He wants to be able to come in the spirit of meekness and love. Then in chapter 2, he says, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, which is what he said in chapter 1, but as of a God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So he is not mishandling and corrupting the word of God, which this is what he says in chapter 4 of this letter. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. So at not walking in craftiness. He, he, that's what he says right here. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth. Notice that. By manifestation of the truth. Paul manifested, taught, exemplified the truth from the scriptures of Moses and the prophets. And that's how he taught. I actually, I actually had a guy last week in a discussion, tell me that Paul never gave the New Testament church an Old Testament answer. I mean, it, sometimes people just say things that just shock me out of my socks. I can't believe that somebody would make a statement like that. Paul said that he taught nothing but what Moses and the prophets said, Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 28. Uh, people came to him there, and he expounded... Uh, the gospel to them from morning till evening from Moses and the prophets. So Paul is saying he's defending and clearing himself that they did not handle the word of God deceitfully. They did not, um, how he said it in the previous example, they're corrupt. They didn't corrupt the word of God. And so he would write to the Philippians in chapter 3 and say, brethren, be followed. Now notice, notice what he does here. As he wrote to the Corinthians, he said, we don't corrupt the word of God. We don't handle the word of God deceitfully. Notice how he writes to the Philippians and says, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. Now think about that. Paul, those with him, they conducted their life, their conversation, in such a way that it was an example of how others were to 
uh, be followers of Christ. And Paul even writes to uh, the church at Corinth back in the first epistle, chapter 11, and he says, be you followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And the word follower means an imitator. Imitate me. So Paul, show, and, and that's, that gives good reason why he would write to Timothy, I don't have the verse on hand, uh, where uh, he told Timothy, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. And so Paul says, we have set the example. Okay, he writes to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and he says, not because we have not power. Now notice that again. Paul had power. And he says, it's not because we don't have power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. And then I wanted to notice what Paul says back in the first epistle in chapter 3. <clears throat> and you can back up to even chapter 1. And notice where he points out there that there was division among them. And he, he wrote to them and, and be, he said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that there be no divisions among you. There in verse 10 of chapter 1. That he told them to be the same mind, the same judgment, that they were all to speak the same thing. And then he goes on in that chapter and points out how that they were uh, creating factions among them. Some was a, would say, I'm of Paul. Some would say that I'm of Peter. Uh, some would say, I'm of Apollos. And others, I'm of Christ. And he settled that dispute, that division, by saying, is Christ divided? A rhetorical question. The obvious answer is no. They were not to be following Apollos, Peter, or Paul. They were to be following Christ. And so he says then in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, he says, For you are yet carnal. Why? For whereas <clears throat> there is among you envying and strife and divisions... Are you not carnal and walk as men? Well, see, that's what they were accusing Paul of, walking according to the flesh. And he is uh, over and over and over again in, in all his epistles. He is proving that that is not true and that they walk in all sincerity, godly sincerity, so as that they are an example unto all and that others can pattern their walk, their life, after uh, the apostle and those working with him. So then he says, uh, um, uh, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Verse 3, for we walk, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, <clears throat> now notice what he says here. <clears throat> It's obvious that he was living in a biological body. Okay, he was physically alive. We walk in the flesh. And I believe that's the context here. But he says, we do not war after the flesh. So Paul wrote in Galatians 2 and verse 20, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now notice, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, again, as Paul would say, though we walk in the flesh, and he says to the Galatians, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And he says here in our text, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And so Paul would later write to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and say, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a good soldier. So here Paul is using the analogy or the metaphor of uh, a soldier and warfare and so forth. And <clears throat> that's what he is uh, he's showing and teaching and encouraging Timothy that as a good soldier, not after the flesh, but of uh, Jesus Christ. Then he says, no man that warreth. So what's he talking about? 
why would he be saying, now the soldier out on the battlefield is a good soldier of Christ? No, that's not what he's saying. That's not the analogy. He is using the analogy of warfare, and he's using the analogy of a soldier and even of the armor in Ephesians 6, which we'll look at as we continue in the study. But he's using this analogy as a Christian and the Christian's warfare. And that's what we need to understand when we go into next to the next verse where he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Because this has been taught for so long that what Paul says right here is proof that we as Christians uh, can't own weapons. We can't defend ourselves. We have to be uh, pacifists, uh, you know, and whatever. That's not what Paul says. That is not the context. We, what, when you look at this and use common sense, what Paul is saying is we don't go out to fight for Christ. We don't go out to preach the gospel. We don't go out trying to convert people to Christianity and use physical weapons. <laughs> that wouldn't do any good. We could force them to be baptized, but that wouldn't do any good because they have to obey from the heart. They have to want to do that. And the power, the power unto salvation is the gospel of Christ, Romans 1, 16. And so uh, uh, I've got a whole lot that I want to say on verse 4, So we're, and I'll be running out of time. I'm not going to get into that and have to stop right in the middle of it. So we'll stop our study on verse 3. And we need to, with this thought here, we need to understand what the Christian's warfare is. And that is we are fighting against spiritual things. And that's what he says as we go on down in this chapter. Uh, it is a spiritual warfare. And you cannot fight a spiritual warfare with carnal weapons. We have to use the sword of the Spirit. As again, we'll see that in Ephesians 6 as we continue on in the study. What Paul teaches here does not indicate that a person is not allowed to defend themselves. And in fact, uh, just to prove that, uh, we'll look at one more verse before we close the study. And that verse is found in Exodus chapter 22, if memory serves. Exodus 22 and verse 2. If a thief be found breaking up, and I'll read this from the New King James Version. If a thief be found breaking in, and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. Now this was given, this was laws given to Israel. They were allowed to defend themselves. And so, and, and even Jesus used the analogy that if the good man of the house would have known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have not allowed the thief to break in and, and to come in and to break up his house. And so this idea, primarily taken from what Paul says in our text, that, uh, <clears throat> that people are not allowed to defend themselves and their loved ones and so forth, that's just not true. That's, that's not scriptural. Um, this is an inalienable right that God gives us, that we are allowed to defend ourselves and our loved ones. Uh, what Paul is teaching in our text is that when we go to war spiritually against sin, against uh, spiritual ignorance, uh, and, I, and I don't mean that in a, in a sl uh, slurry way, I just mean people don't know. Now that's ignorance. There's a cure for ignorance. There's knowledge. Knowledge is the opposite of ignorance. So the way we gain knowledge, and we are commanded in the Bible to gain knowledge. And the way we do that is through study. And we, we study and apply God's Word. And this is how we overcome sin and ignorance. And hopefully, uh, God's Word will, will provoke love and humility in the hearts of people. And by that, see, that, that's how we fight this spiritual warfare, and we use uh, 
the armor, the Christian armor, the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation, and so forth that Paul mentions in Ephesians 6, which Lord willing, we'll look at that uh, in our next assembly, in our next study. So <clears throat> we'll, with those thoughts, uh, we'll conclude our study here uh, this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 10.